I want to thank you very much for coming uh, to AEI. We welcome you here this morning to talk about a, an issue that is really everyone's business, and that's freedom of expression uh, and of uh, particularly of the media. Uh, one of the prized principles of Western democracy, of course, is respect for freedom of speech and specifically of the independent media. Uh, our, one of our founding fathers, Thomas Jefferson, stated it plainly 225 years ago, were it left for me to decide whether we should have a government without newspapers or newspapers without government, I should not hesitate a moment to prefer the latter. Hugo Chavez and his acolytes in Latin America today beg to differ, and citizens in the region are paying a high price for authoritarian populists who are determined to hold on to power by muzzling independent journalists. Of course, the Castro dictatorship takes the prize for censorship in the Americas. Although, although Cuba was once home to a thriving independent media, 58 daily newspapers and 160 independent radio stations, those outlets of free expression are long since forgotten on the island. In Venezuela, Hugo Chavez apparently will succumb to cancer before he matches Castro's record. However, 13 years of authoritarian rule has taken its toll. He has revoked the license of nations Leadest, leading broadcasting uh, television stations, propped up state-run competitors, and forced all media to forfeit revenue as they carry his uh, marathon tirades. Venezuelan journalists and their employers have been bullied by official mobs, and some have been forced into exile. The remaining so-called independent, independent TV station practices rigorous self-censorship as its owners preserve its sweetheart deals with the Chavez regime. In Argentina, successive Kirchner governments have used a new 2009 licensing law to put two-thirds of the broadcast spectrum in the hands of state control or friendly news organizations. As recently as last December, in a coup de grace in the government's long-running battle with independent media outlets, Kirchner loyalists in the Congress approved a law giving state control over the production and distribution of newsprint, putting independent newspapers on a very tight leash. Individual media operators, printing presses, and newsrooms have been raided by tax collectors in a not-so-subtle threat against their independence. Violent state-run uh, mobs have attacked independent media houses. Freedom House reported recently that journalists in Argentina, quote, faced increased attacks and harassment, and there are officially sanctioned attempts to restrict the production and distribution of newspapers. In Honduras, the, protect, uh, the Committee to Protect 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 Journalist noted last December that, quote, seven journalists had been murdered in a matter of weeks. The CPJ stated, quote, after minimizing the crimes, Honduran authorities are slow and negligent in pursuing the killers. The government is fostering a climate of lawlessness that allow is allowing criminals to kill journalists with impunity, end quote. Last month, adding insult to injury, Honduran President Pepe Lobo promised to send to Congress uh, a law regulating freedom of expression, insisting that the rules were necessary to ensure that news organizations are ethical and impartial. We will hear from our panelists about the bizarre personal vendettas being waged by Ecuador's President Rafael Correa against the news media. However, I can't help but to mention one recent law passed by his ruling party that forbids the media from reporting on potential presidential candidates, with President Correa expected to seek re-election in 2013. Although we will highlight the pattern of, of new abuses of press freedom by leftist populist, uh, popular regimes, I hasten to add that this is not an ideological phenomenon. In several countries, journalists are literally under fire from criminal gangs, and some governments across the political spe spectrum have a ten tendency to turn a blind eye to this sort of threat. Independent journalists have a legitimate, indispensable role to play in exposing corruption and abuse of power as well as educating their readers and viewers on issues of public policy. Indeed, Article 4 of the Inter-American Democratic Charter, which was signed on September 11, 2001, uh, we explicitly linked government, quote, transparency and, quote, responsible public administration with free press, calling both, quote, essential components of the exercise of democracy. It is fair to ask whether these ideals are being respected and protected in the Americas today. I would suggest that this is not just the media's business, it is the responsibility of every citizen. Our panelists will address this issue from across the, uh, the uh, uh, different disciplines, heavy emphasis on practitioners. Uh, our first uh, panelist, we will ask them each to speak in turn, about seven or eight minutes. 
uh, and I will limit your freedom of expression after about eight minutes. Uh, our first panelist is Milton Coleman, who is the senior editor of the Washington Post and the current president of the Inter-American Press Association. Mr. Coleman graduated from the University of Wisconsin in Milwaukee, joined the Washington Post in 1976, and was promoted to the deputy managing editor position in 1996. He became president of the American Society of News Editors in April 2010. Mr. Coleman has served as, the member, as a member of the nominating committee for the Pulitzer Prizes in Journalism a judge for the Robert F. Kennedy Journalism Award and the National Association of Black Journalists and Asian American Journalists Association Awards and is a chairman of the judging committee of the Selden Ring Award for investigative reporting. Mr. Coleman will present the Inter-American Press Association's overall assessment of press freedom situation in the region in seven or eight minutes. <laughs> it's an impossible task but we'll have a chance to ask questions and then we will he will also explain what the uh, Inter-American Press Association is doing to address the challenge. Thank you, sir. Thank you, uh, Ambassador Noriega. And I, I could very easily do this in seven or eight minutes if I simply uh, ratify your report, which was quite good, <laughs> uh, which I will do. And also, in the interest of full disclosure, point out something that I only learned recently, and that is that I was at the University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee at the same time, but uh, never knew him as uh, Alberto Fujimori. <laughs> 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 yeah. uh, it is a pleasure to be here on behalf of the Inter-American Press Association, which this year will turn 70 years old. And in a nutshell, uh, I will try to uh, not go into things that the ambassador has already said. Uh, the situation on press freedom in Latin America is good in some places, uh, not so good in others, and really no good uh, in a few uh, that are actually uh, too many. Uh, the problem we have is, is that basically, uh, States in Latin America really are, I think, trying to, to move in the right direction to express the freedom of the press and, and freedom uh, of information. But there are large impediments. Uh, let me talk about some of those in no particular order. One of them is drugs, drug trafficking. And drug trafficking uh, now is leading to more dangers of journalists uh, in many states than it is uh, uh, government action or government inaction regarding uh, killings that go on with impunity. In uh, Mexico last year, there were uh, seven journalists killed, uh, many along the border. Uh, many places along the border, news organizations refuse to cover drug trafficking and corruption. When you ask them why, it's simple. They say because reporters get killed. So we simply don't cover that. Uh, another problem is the, is the lingering laws uh, regarding crimes of defamation. Uh, and, and no clearer example is there of that in, uh, in Ecuador where uh, the president of the country, the elected president of the country, uh, has gone after uh, El Universal, uh, saying that uh, an opinion column, not a news story, an opinion column, uh, uh, dishonored him. And therefore, the uh, editor and author of the column and three directors of El Universal should uh, spend three years in jail and pay each $10 million. And, and because he brought charges, not as the president, but as himself, then uh, he gets the 40 million if they're paid, uh, which I think no matter which way you add that up, it doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. And whether whether it's the actual pay outcomes or not, the the effort is clear. It is to intimidate the press, is to drive to more self censorship. And uh, he's brought another lawsuit on uh, another suit has been brought on behalf of um, his uh, brother, uh, in which two two book authors have raised questions about whether or not the president steered. Uh, contracts toward his big brother, Gano Mano, uh, and they're, they've sentenced uh, to uh, pay uh, a couple of million dollars each. You know, Jaime Mantilla, who is to succeed me as president of the Inter-American Press Association, uh, refused to name uh, reporters who wrote an article. Jaime's being threatened uh, with three, uh, mo three months in jail uh, and fines. It is all part of a pattern to intimidate news media into not reporting uh, capped by uh, what the ambassador was saying earlier, uh, this idea uh, that you shouldn't cover presidential elections. I mean, what, what is that? That, 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 that makes, uh, to me, uh, very little sense. Um, and all this because of these crimes of, of, uh, of honor, which most, which in the United States we don't, have, we don't allow this. We have different standards for public officials. But what these, what these laws do is they stifle public criticism 
uh, and accountability reporting. Um, uh, we also have uh, uh, demonization of the news media by many elected leaders, uh, where they, uh, if you want to get a lesson in name calling, just listen to some of the statements by President Hugo Chavez and President Rafael Correa, uh, who uh, actually defame uh, reporters in the way that they speak about them. Uh, and also in many countries, uh, other groups, not necessarily governmental groups, um, uh, intimidate news media people and, while the authorities stand by and, and do nothing. This has happened uh, in Venezuela. Another movement taking place is the, is, uh, the expropriation of, of media uh, by the state um, and to then use that media as a way to compete with private uh, industry news, news organizations. For example, according to our research, uh, in Nicaragua, President Daniel Ortega became the sole private owner of channels four and five and radio stations, Yaha and Sandino, with public funds. Uh, President Chavez in Venezuela expropriated RCTV in 2007, as well as five other cable channels and 34 radio stations. Meanwhile, he created 238 radio stations, 28 television stations, 340 print media, and more than 125 sites for propaganda on the Internet. Uh, and a multimedia international news agency, President Correa confiscated television channels and a newspaper and used public funds to create the newspaper Periodico Popular, which strategically competes against the other print media. Uh, in Bolivia, President Evo Morales created a network of community radio and television stations and purchased print media with funds provided by the Venezuelan government, media that he uses for personal interests. So you can see that this is not a really good atmosphere. IAPA is working with other uh, organizations on, on many fronts, including uh, trying to do everything we can to stop uh, Ecuador and other countries from weakening the office of the Special Rapporteur for Freedom of Expression of the Organization of American States. Uh, they would like to uh, cut off that, uh, the funding for it, they would like to uh, reduce uh, its independence, and they would like to, uh, in effect, uh, get rid of the person who is now in the office, who President Correa loves to call names in radio addresses, uh, a very capable Colombian, uh, former Colombian judge, uh, Catalina Botero Marino. And so we're, do we're doing that along with sending missions to various countries uh, and working to try to provide legal remedies and to try to provide legal guidelines such as the establishment of special prosecutors to prosecute crimes uh, against journalism and journalists. And I think I probably am up to the 30-second warning on my seven minutes, mm -hmm. right? Actually, you did rather well. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, and I think Joel's probably going to ratify most of your report as well, so we can move along rather quickly here. Uh, Joel D. Hurst is a Human Freedom Fellow at the George W. Bush Institute. He grew up in Argentina, Costa Rica, and Venezuela, and has his master's degree in international development from Brandeis University. Previously, Mr. Hurst was a recipient of the International Affairs Fellowship at the Council on Foreign Relations. He worked with USAID's Office of Transition Initiatives here in Washington and for two years for the office uh, in Uganda. Prior to this service, uh, Joel worked as a humanitarian relief worker for World Vision. He has written chapters for the books uh, by the International Republican Institute and the University of Miami, as well as many articles for America's Quarterly, Fox News, International Business and Development Exchange, The Commentator, and El Universal, I guess, in Venezuela. Uh, Joel blogs also for the Huffington Post. We've asked Joel to focus on systematic campaigns against the media by authoritarian populist uh, regimes in the Americas. Please, Joel. Thanks. Thanks, Ambassador Noriega. Um, can I have the, the clicker? Yes, if that works. Um, so uh, Ambassador Noriega asked me to talk a little bit about the historical project of, of Bolivarianism, which, which we've discussed is, is uh, going across the Latin America. A little bit of historical precedent. After the fall of the Soviet Union, representative <laughs> democracy and free market capitalism uh, became the norm uh, with all of their rights and obligations. For the Americas, through the American Declaration on, on the Rights and Duties of Man, the American Convention on, of Human Rights, the almost universal acceptance of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Liberties, as well as the Inter-American <coughs> Democratic Charter, which Ambassador Noriega actually helped to draft, um, a democracy, representative democracy, became international customary law for the Americas. However, in the 21st century, an increasingly large group of countries is challenging this, threatening to return the region to dictatorship and misery. Um, so, uh, and this is about one component of this, of this, pro of this, <laughs> let's see if this works. 
you really have to hit them. This is not. I don't think. I don't know if it's. Or just click the down the space bar. Space bar? I guess. Yeah. Excellent. So, um. <coughs> Got a human clicker now. That's right. <laughs> So the one step of this is the, con is the control of what they call est establishing communicational hegemony as part as an important component, as an important step in their political project. Um, but what is the political project? Change. Next. Next. They are attempting to replace representative, because this is not working. Okay. Just put it on the tie. That's, that's it. Okay. Um, sorry. Because they are because these nations are generally speaking weak economically and um, militarily, they have uh, a, they must attain maintain perceived legitimacy. In order to do this, they juxtapose what we call representative democracy with a model uh, that they call participatory and protagonist democracy. In this, they exchange legitimacy to what they call the permanent majorities. Uh, they attempt to destroy the opposition. They uh, maintain that separation of powers weakens the state, blur the lines between government, state, and political party, uh, use conflict to cement those permanent majorities, uh, allow through referenda presidents for as long as the permanent majority allow, uh, and use the partisan civil service uh, at the, for the service of the revolution and they have a secretive centralized government. Um, for human rights, they attempt to replace what we know as civil and political liberties within all the covenants that we signed, which is, uh, like I said before, customary international law, with economic, social, and cultural rights. So they replace speech for the rights to a job. Um, they maintain that the international treaties which protect these rights that we have all signed are actually mechanisms of imperial control used by the developed world to dominate them. Uh, and they are, these use the constant permanent referenda by the permanent majority to dismantle these rights. Now the problem is, if you could go down one. So the question remains, how do you build and keep a permanent majority? Step one um, of, a, of multiple steps in this process, which I think Ecuador is living, which Venezuela has lived, Bolivia, Nicaragua. Step one is you have to build communicational hegemony. So. Um, as we mentioned here, in order to do this first, you establish a vast network of state propaganda mechanisms and apparatuses, starting from Telesur at the top and going all the way down to, to blogs like Aporrea, et cetera, to, to maintain this, this intense communicational hegemony. Um, but at the same time, if you can change it, you have to destroy the opposition's ability to communicate. You can no longer do this because of the importance of perceived legitimacy. You can no longer do this by just usually by just taking over a TV station or just going after and killing journalists like they used to do back in the day. You have they use a much more sophisticated mechanism, and President Correa has become the expert at this, to dismantle the ability of the opposition to communicate. They use uh, economic means, for example, the fine against Tal Cual in Venezuela for millions of dollars, the fine against El Universo, uh, the tackling government uh, pulling government advertisement. They use verbal attacks, which has happened against El Clarín, Universo, La Prensa, El Nuevo Diario, Globovisión, RCTV, and all stations across the region. Um, they use physical attacks, which have happened as well, usually by people who are akin to the government, but in the paramilitary groups or within the civil society groups. Um, seizure of airspace, of course, the most important to this is RCTV uh, in the run-up to the 2007 referendum in Venezuela. Uh, President Chavez also sees 33 regional radio stations. Uh, they use tariffs on importing paper, which is what's happening to El Nuevo Diario in, in Nicaragua right now. Um, frivolous lawsuits. Um, and then, at the end of all this, they offer a reprieve for a change in editorial line, which we've seen, for example, in Venevision in Venezuela. As long as you don't go after the administration, we're going to allow you to do all your other telenovelas and everything else that you, that you do. So. Um, what does this lead to? Uh, it leads to, most of the time, the press doesn't disappear. 
it just leads to self-censorship where the journalists, before they write an op-ed that they think might anger somebody, better not. Uh, loss of market share. The government then supplants with their, with their papers the market share of the, uh, of the opposition newspapers or the independent newspapers, um, and thereby the message of the, of, of the free press is not, is not really heard. Uh, economic ruin. Between defending yourself against frivolous lawsuits, defending yourself against, uh, against, the, market, against the loss of market share by government uh, propaganda, and uh, the, the risk of, and of course you've got the risk of prison, uh, what you end up with is an opposition that a lot of them choose not to take on the fight. And a uh, nice quote from, from Lenin. So uh, that's basically the political, the one, the first political, the, the first approach to dismantling uh, representative democracy through the control of the media. Is that it, Joel? Was it? Okay, fantastic. Uh, we always like to include at least one quote by Lenin here at AEI. <laughs> <laughs> we've addressed, we've got, we, we, we met our quota. Uh, thank you very much for that presentation. And this uh, presentation will be online uh, on AEI.org site so you can recover it. Uh, Nicolas Perez is the co-owner and co-director of El Universo, Ecuador's largest independent newspaper, which was investigated and, exp and which has investigated and exposed official corruption in Ecuador. Since 2011, El Universo has been fighting a criminal libel suit filed against the paper by Ecuadorian President Rafael Correa, who took issue with an opinion column the newspaper printed criticizing uh, Correa's uh, response to police protests in 2010. With the final appeal pending and following substantial judicial interference, President Correa has been awarded, as the others have referred to uh, this morning, historic damages of $40 million, and Nicolás and his two brothers each face three years, uh, three year jail sentences in addition to the fine. Mr. Pettis will explain Correa's abuse of the courts to persecute the independent media in his country. Mr. Pettis. Thank you, Ambassador. Um, yes, um, there's uh, two big uh, aspects to, to our case um, and, and Ecuador's scenario in general. One is uh, free speech, um, and we've spoken um, We've been spoken, speaking for last year about uh, the chilling effect that this sentencing, the sen the, the, the finalization of this case might get to. But uh, we see that the chilling effect is already in place. Um, we s we've seen that the, in the last year, um, actually I think uh, a year ago to this date, February 9th, uh, Emilio's piece was published. Um, and we received a lawsuit on, on March of last year. Um, but we have been talking about the, the potential chilling effect, and we think it is in place already. We have seen that, we see that there's really a, a, a small group of, of, of people that, are, that keeps picking up uh, in the print media um, and in digital media, uh, but there really is, uh, every time there's less of them. And most, most of them are really just toning it down and yeah. just s are silencing themselves. So we see self-censorship already in place. Um, Whatever the, the, the final sentencing might be, um, I think the president has already achieved a big goal in, in, in silencing you know, traditional media and individuals also. Because El Universo is maybe the, the biggest, most notorious you know, spoken about case, but there have been more, I mean, but you have uh, independent journalists like Calderon and Surita being sentenced like uh, two days ago. And, and Fundamedios has documented, up at, uh, I think, around 50 cases of individuals that have been detained or imprisoned just by expressing dissent in some form, directly to the president or indirectly. So, um, again, uh, it's, this is not only El Universo, again, is, is a big case, is, 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 is very honing on, but, but there's a lot more going on. It's really all about you know, free speech. And we believe that uh, this chilling effect, this silencing effect they need uh, on, on not only traditional outlets, but individuals, because social media is there and individuals can express themselves through social media now, uh, has the, uh, the purpose to actually you know, keep everybody quiet while they are really you know, uh, controlling all the other aspects of government. You know, uh, we, uh, I'm gonna get to the judiciary in a second, but if you see a, all the other uh, uh, um, uh, power uh, entities or institutions in the country that are under Correa's control, like the Electoral Council first and then the Constitutional Court, you can see how really this, precedent, this presidency 
has so much uh, 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 power and, 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 and unified power in, in, in the country. I think it is, and, and once you get to, and once you see the control he has over the judiciary, you see that this is probably the, the, the country where there is least independence of powers in the region, most probably. So getting to the judiciary, our process has been probably the one that has evidenced you know, best what all the abuses and all the control of the judiciary power. Um, starting with the uh, first sentence, you know, in the first instance, the local judge was uh, the fifth judge in a series of judges that were, you know, uh, being uh, kicked out and put in, and he took office the day before uh, um, we were sentenced, and he left office the day after we were sentenced. So in those 48 hours, he took office, he reviewed 5,000 pages of the case, you know, he held a hearing that lasted for eight hours, and then he wrote down 156 pages of the sentencing, and then he left office because the original judge, you know, number one, he was, he was number five, took office right next day when we were sentenced. So that's just one piece. And then, you know, there's been months of irregularity, you know, irregularities uh, throughout the whole process. And where it is now is that uh, the, the process has spilled into the new court, the new court took place 10 days ago, uh, which is Correa's court, because he, he pretty much, uh, uh, well, he, through referendum, the people asked of him to replace the old courts. And we have documented that 14 of the 21 judges have collaborated with Correa in some form, direct or indirect. So we think they, they are uh, um, his people. So uh, this new court is the one that's going to have, you know, in, in, uh, to decide on the last sentencing on the appeals court at the cassation level, you know, about our case. And, and we don't see how we can get a fair trial, you know, in, in either last court or this court, in the whole process. Um, and, and, and one idea, or one thing that can give you an idea is how our case has been fast-tracked through all the courts um, in, in, through all the courts in general, through all the, the, the steps throughout the process. Um, I don't know if this is on or off. I think it's should be fine. Just yeah. Like that? Um, Calderon and Zurita got their first sentencing just two days ago, and they were sued before we did. Um, and, and we are already at a cassation level, you know, in less than 12 months. So that tells you how our case has been really on a fast track onto all the levels because they really need this sentencing. Now, the last thing I want to say is um, there's been talk about, I mean, the president has said, about, has been speaking about a presidential pardon. Meaning, I don't want anybody to go to jail, you know, I don't want a single cent of these guys, you know, I just want the sentencing to stand, because that is the judicial, judicial precedent that he needs. Um, so there's two things about this. One of the things is that there's two innovations in this sentencing, in the, in the, in the, in the suit and the sentencing itself, which is that publishers are, in, in, in this sentencing, it states that the publishers are responsible for somebody else's opinion. Mm -hmm. And the second part is that the companies are also responsible for their employees' actions, you know, and they're liable also uh, to, to pay indemnizations. So this innovations that are going to be uh, 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 set in stone in this, in this new sentencing are going to be a precedent for lawsuits to come. And this, and not only for lawsuits to come, but also for real censorship, because I don't think that there's going to be a company that's going to be hiring editors, and I don't think there's going to be editors that are going to be actually letting go of every single comma and period on an opinion piece, even if it's by a third party, you know, to be printed or published if I'm going to be liable for it. You know. So uh, I think real censorship is going to set in because of this sentencing. Um, and, and it's just, uh, it's just uh, really sad. Well, thank you very much. Let me ask you to clarify. Now, Emilio Palacio is the columnist who wrote yes. that column about a year ago. He's, according to the press, just sought uh, political asylum here in the United States. Yes, he had his hearing yesterday. Can you just explain what it is that he wrote that got under Correa's skin? Um, what, um, they cite a specific paragraph in the whole piece where it, the, the piece is about uh, the consequences of, of what took place on the 30th of September uh, of 2010 on, on the coup, what he call, the President Correa calls it, um, and his police upheaval about you know salaries and stuff. Um, uh, there's a paragraph where uh, Emilio tells the, the, the president that he should be uh, careful that, that in, in the near future, some other president, maybe an enemy of his, uh, might uh, uh, pursue him in an international court 
for, uh, for um, crimes of lesser humanity because of ordering fire into a police hospital, uh, into a hospital full of civilians. Uh, those were loosely his words. Um, and, and the president, uh, President Correa, uh, he interprets that that was an affirmation, that it was, the, that, that, that is, that it was a stated fact when it is not real. So he's saying that, you know, we printed a lie, and because of that, we're all, you know, responsible. Um, and, uh, and Emilio has been sustaining all along, that arguing all along that he has not sustained a lie, he has just, you know, expressed an opinion of a hypothetical, really. Right. So you, I can see criminalizing, uh, being tempted to criminalize uh, when people misstate a fact. Uh, it's even more tenuous to criminalize an implication. Now, now he's seeking to criminalize an inference, which is yes. he inferred that he meant something negative about him. Well, at any rate, he's a, he's a special character. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. We'll, we'll move now to Rafael Cuesta, who is news vice president of Channel One in Ecuador. He's a native of Guayaquil. He studied journalism at the University of Kansas and Central University of Ecuador in Quito. Mr. Cuesta started his career as a television news reporter, going on to become news director and vice president of the largest television station in Ecuador. Due to his comments during a coup of January 20, of year 2000, he was the victim of, a, of an assassination attempt when a cassette bomb exploded in his hands. Mr. Cuesta has been a consul in Ecuador, uh, of Ecuador and in Genoa, Italy, and a congressman representing his native province. Mr. Cuesta will recount his personal experiences and explain the plight of other independent journalists in Ecuador. Mr. Cuesta. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. Um, uh, I'm going to try to show you a whole picture of Ecuador and freedom of expression in seven minutes, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I had to write it down so I can, I can be accurate. It, since um, when I was a, a, a university student in the 70s, I saw uh, illegal detentions of our columnists and journalists. I saw uh, attacks and vandalism against the radio stations and TV stations. I saw firsthand hand how newspapers were shut down. These were all shameful acts that took place during a dictatorship. However, in democracy, has no been very different. Between the years 1980 and 2006, before President Correa, there were several illegal detentions of columnists and journalists. Radio and television stations were illegal, illegally shut down. Journalists were fired at the request of the government. That's a very typical, uh, uh, how do you say, uh, form of act uh, for, for some governments to call the owner and say, I don't want him writing about me, or I don't want that journalist in your, in your media. There were even violent attacks with bombs against newsmen and arbitrary withdrawals of radio frequencies. From 2007 to date, Ecuador has seen the government take over a daily newspaper, the seizure of or expropriation of five television stations, the closure and seizure of several radio stations, and trials against journalists and the media. No democratic government is innocent of this. However, it is important to highlight that incidents that took place before 2007 were isolated events because of the intolerance of a president or some frustrated government official. The closures, arrests, bombs, and trials were directed against one media outlet or a journalist in particular. It was not a part of a grand scheme to stop the press. Since 2007, the blows against the press and freedom of expression are not isolated events. That's the difference. They are all part of a government strategy who tries to concentrate power. The ruling party, through a comfortable majority in the a legislative branch has managed to control and dominate all other branches of government. The administration of justice, the electoral system, and the constitutional court have all been subdued by the executive branch. I can assure though that uh, every previous president of Ecuador has wanted this power. The difference is that this government has managed to attain it. 
and it believes that in order to maintain this power, it is also necessary to control the public opinion. And to achieve this goal, they have put in place several tactics. First of all, aggressive advertising campaigns in favor of the government, in the same plan than Venezuela, strengthening of public media, seizure of private media, creation of a gag law, and trials against media and journalists. I will refer to the last three. In 2008, using as a pretext a banking trial initiated in 1999 that had not been concluded yet, the Ecuadorian government seized two open television stations and three cable TV stations, as well as two radio stations, two magazines, and a printing press, among other companies owned by the Isaias family. The government said that the obje objective of the seizure was to recoup some of the money that the Ecuador Ecuadorian state had given to the former bankers. These companies were supposed to be sold immediately. The expropriation was illegal. Due process was not respected and the right to a defense was violated by the Constituent Assembly when it banned, prohibited judges and courts to accept any challenge to those affected by the seizures. So you cannot defend yourself. After more than 12 years, this trial is still without verdict. No one has been found guilty of any crimes. However, we all know that it will end with a guilty verdict because otherwise the government would have to return the seized companies. The seizure of these media outlets never had the purpose to recover money for the country. The real motive was to acquire more media that would be at their service. The proof of this is that almost four years later, and there is there's no uh, indication that they want to sell these companies. In Ecuador, there is no communication act or law, even though its creation was mandated by popular referendum last year. There is a bill developed by ruling party congressmen, which is ready to be voted on in March. This bill initially included atrocities against uh, the press. Uh, fortunately, most of them have been withdrawn. There are still some questionable points that relate the ulterior responsibility that Nicholas talked about it, of journalists, which include penal sanctions, the joint responsibility of owners and managers of the media who would be held legally accountable for the opinions of their journalists, the obligation to broadcast countless hours of chains and government messages, the obligation that newspapers publish their circulation numbers, and the inequitable distribution of radio and television frequencies. These are some of the points that still concern the private media today. The Ecuador Ecuadorian penal laws include prison for libel and libellous slander. The first case occurs when a person is offended, and the second occurs when a person is publicly accused of committing a crime. This legal aberration that has been eliminated in most of the world is now being used against media and journalists. Such is the case of newspaper El Universo and its editor Emilio Palacio. I will not go into a detailed analysis of what Mr. Palacio wrote because in my opinion he did indeed accuse the president of committing a crime and had no and didn't give a proof of it. However, I do not think he should lose his freedom because of this. Even worse still, the owners of El Universo, who in my opinion had no participation and therefore no responsibility in what was written by the columnist, should not be taken to the courts. In addition to this, they have been punished with an unpayable economic sanction of $40 million, which would result probably in the bankruptcy and subsequent, subsequent closure of the most important newspaper in Ecuador. What is happening in Ecuador in regard of freedom of expression is not something that surprises me. It, it is something that someday had to happen, and it's happening now, because the media and journalists have paved the way for it in some way. Economic interests, disputes between media owners, attacks of one against the other, have created that perfect breeding ground 
for a ruler who came to power thanks to the media and now wants to control them. We all have our share of the blame of having failed to stop in time the painful task of destroying each other. We all have abused at one point or another of the privilege of being a communicator. Not everything can be blamed on the government and on Mr. Correa. If the national press had acted responsibly in the first place, no political power would have been even would, would have even there to attack it. That's all. Great presentation. I appreciate that very much. And you brought up a lot of interesting issues. Uh, uh, by the way, it occurs to me if if our press couldn't report on uh, or couldn't accuse our presidents of crimes, we, we would probably, the unemployment rate would go up by a couple of percent, just all the journalists <laughs> who, had no, who had nothing to do, or the news, but uh, at any rate. Let me uh, get to a question that Mr. Coleman alluded to, which was the Special Rapporteur for Freedom of Expression at the uh, Inter-American Commission on Human Rights. There was a, the impetus of this meeting, in point of fact, was a conversation I had with a reporter who told me that the, the Special Rapporteur had, com had confided in him that, uh, that the Ecuadorian delegation was after their funding. Um, you know, I was ambassador to the OAS and weeks after uh, the countries uh, uh, failed to elect a, an American to the Commission on Human Rights, I felt it important to go in and, and in point of fact, increase our contribution to the American, our voluntary contribution to the American Commission on Human Rights because it does extraordinarily important work. And today, with the OAS sort of uh, dumbed down by uh, Chavez's clique, it, the American Commission on Human Rights is really one of the only entities that's doing anything. So could you sort of explain the importance of the Special Rapporteur uh, and this, inter and broadly, this solidarity, this inter-American solidarity. Well, we can ask you all to comment, but Mr. Coleman, could you? Sure. The, um, uh, the, there are, the OAS has eight rapporteurships, uh, only one special rapporteurship. That is a special rapporteur for uh, freedom of expression. And uh, the reason that, that that one is special is because uh, the OAS believes that freedom of expression is a central part uh, of the democratic process, and therefore uh, it needs to have a special status. And um, that uh, office is currently held by a, a, a Colombian former judge, Catalina Botero. And what it does uh, is several things. Number one, it issues a report. It issues its own report, annual report, which country by country tells the, says what is the situation regarding freedom of expression. The uh, Ecuadorian delegation uh, would like to do away with that report and reduce it from an average of about 400 pages uh, a year to two. Um, secondly, uh, because it is a special rapporteurship, uh, it gets no money, not a dime, from the OAS, uh, and, but is allowed to raise its own uh, money. Uh, its budget now is three to ten times the size of that of all the other special rapporteur of all the other rapporteurships because of that. And much of that money is raised from foundations that earmark it for freedom of expression. So it's not like you could take the, uh, the money from the special rapporteur's office and pass it out uh, everybody in equal uh, ways. No, that, that, that doesn't happen. Uh, so they're arguing that, Ecuadorian delegation is arguing, that the money should be equal for everybody. And if you do that, it means you're going to cut the special rapporteur's budget by about 90% because it's going to come down to where everybody else's uh, budget is. The third thing that they're trying to do is to, um, is to say that we need, we need guidelines on the way that rapporteurships carry themselves. The effect of this in practice would be to stop the special rapporteur for freedom of expression of uh, saying uh, in advance of, of a court action, this would really, really be bad. I mean, if, if, if this new procedure went into effect, for instance, the special rapporteur would have no ability to say anything at all about the case regarding El Universo until after this final appeal is completed when who knows what. 
uh, when, rather. And so all of this is being done in the name of making the inter-American system uh, better functioning. And it's done in sort of innocuous language uh, because uh, that, that conceals uh, the real effort. They talk about simply uh, making everybody equal. Well, if you make everybody equal, you do that by, in effect, uh, taking rid of, getting, getting rid of a lot of the special rapporteurs, uh, independence, and, and, and funds. So where is this at now? The special working group uh, of the OAS was established in, uh, in June, and it met on December 13th, and uh, uh, the, the permanent council of the OAS uh, accepted these recommendations. And then there was another meeting, uh, January 15th, I believe it was, uh, in which the, um, uh, uh, it, was, it was also voted upon and, ex and accepted um, by, I'm sorry, the Permanent Council accepted that on, on, on January 15th. It now goes to the Commission, the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights, probably sometime uh, in March to see if they will adopt it completely adopted res with, with, with reservations and amendments uh, or throw it uh, uh, out the window. We in IAPA have been uh, trying to rally forces. Uh, some 60 organizations have uh, come out in favor of not doing this. There were strong editorials uh, in the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Los Angeles Times. Uh, other uh, there's, a, there's been a really good editorial in a newspaper in Uruguay. Uh, in the in the past week to try to save this uh, office because this office is really very important to freedom of expression and and that is what the the controversy uh, uh, is all about so so far uh, these efforts have been able to stop things from getting worse and during the discussions the American delegation the Uruguayan delegation the Canadian delegation the Chileans uh, were very strong in making it not as bad as it actually is, but it's still bad. And so uh, that's an effort that many of us uh, are trying to marshal our forces. Uh, and instead, what the Ecuadorians are doing uh, is calling the special rapporteur by name, a bunch of names, uh, and trying to cut off the funding uh, for it. And uh, civil society is sort of fighting back. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Pettis and Mr. Cuesta, how important uh, is this sort of international solidarity to your efforts uh, back at, in your country? Uh, um, I've been through a, a process uh, uh, in, in the uh, uh, Commission of Human Rights of OAS, and because of the bomb attack I received, it took me five years to get a merit report. And uh, uh, in Ecuador, merit reports are mandatory according to our constitution. Uh, the government had accomplished one of the three recommendations that the uh, commission uh, asked them. And they don't want to accomplish the other two recommendations because they don't want to, just because of that. They don't believe in that. We have an attorney general, uh, Mr. Diego Garcia, that doesn't believe in human rights, and so he doesn't care about, about my case. And. Uh, um, I agree with uh, Mr. Coleman, absolutely. Uh, OAS should uh, support more uh, the rapporteur of freedom of expression. I think uh, it's the commission that is, is in charge to uh, guard uh, uh, this freedom because it's the, the base for democracy. Um, but it's the problem I see in this uh, uh, rap uh, rapporteur of uh, freedom of expression is that sometimes it gets more uh, likely to support states instead of victims. And I, I think they should support more the victims than the states. So they get too involved with uh, uh, governments and, doesn't, and, and perhaps they lose the, the whole picture and they lose the, what, the, what citizens are, are uh, suffering in that moment. So I agree. I think the, uh, 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 the special commission, the special rapporteur of freedom of expression, should get more money uh, uh, instead of limiting uh, their funds. Great. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to throw it open to questions. We have somebody with a microphone. I'd just ask you to identify yourself uh, and uh, 
and, and put it in the form of an actual question. Thank you. I've just got two real quick questions. And I really am grateful to every single one of you out there today. Your presentations were terrific. And this is very timely. Everybody is watching this issue. And we're really grateful that you all have brought this together. Let me just um, ask my two quick questions. Um, we have calculated that, my name is Maggie Petito, thank you. We've calculated that about 95% of all Ecuadorian media is state controlled and owned or state censored. These media need data, data on the percentage out there of how much of their media is controlled by Correa and how did he take over that media? And today, we need the data from you all. How much of the seized state-run media today is running packaged Iranian media? We anticipate that the number will be heavy. So that's sort of a question. If you have an answer for that one, please say it today. But I'm going to guess that we need more information, along with the percentage of, which is very high, we all know this, of Correa's propaganda gearing up for his probable re-election. My second quick question is more personal. Yesterday, Palacio's asylum request in Florida atypically did not receive an immediate answer. He's been in Florida for some time. That is atypical. I have never, ever known one person who has suffered either physical assault from Correa's bullies or thugs to be granted asylum in the United States. The astonishing determination that Palacio would have to wait for many months to get an asylum ruling where no Ecuadorian has ever been granted asylum in the United States was surprising. I hope they uphold his request. I'm getting to my question. I thought that but heretofore, mm -hmm. every asylum request has been denied because the U.S. Department of State for the last three years reports that there's not one thing wrong with Ecuador. It's the same as the Bahamas. So why do you need asylum? It's a perfect place. So I ask you, what will happen to Mr. Palacio if he is denied asylum and deported back to Ecuador? Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, no, it's okay. I'm, I care I'm, about I'm, this. <laughs> um, I'm, I don't have any data, uh, data on, on your first uh, question yet. Um, uh, it's interesting. <laughs> um, I think uh, uh, if, if Emilio is denied uh, asylum, he will be deported back. And, and, and even uh, there's no sentence. I mean, he, I'm sorry, let me re rectify this. He has a sentencing already. Okay, and this is one of the absurdities of our case. Even though we were sued as a group, you know, Emilio and and and, and the three directors of the of El Universo and and the company were all sued as as, as one as one thing, and, we're, and they were asked to be sent to Yale, uh, all of us. Um, when we got to the second, when we got to a first appeals court, we appealed the first sentencing, got to the appeals court. At that level, at the provincial level, the provincial court, um, we uh, we appealed to cassation, and Emilio also did. Emilio's lawyers did too. And even though we all appealed to cassation to, to go to a third level, to the national court level, Emilio's appeal was denied, but ours was accepted. And this is extremely irregular because it's all one lawsuit, and and in that one lawsuit. The, the courts made a difference, and they 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 sentenced Emilio, then they or, or they denied his concession, and then he uh, he presented another recourse, and then denied that. So his sentencing, sort of like, he was already sentenced, but his sentencing was not could not be executed. I mean, there was no um, he he sentencing stands, but he has not been. Uh, uh, there was no. Uh, uh, order, of order, order, order of arrest. The, the order of arrest right. hasn't been issued because even though the sentencing stands, you know, the final sentencing on the rest of the group 
or in the lawsuit is not yet ready. So it's it's all confusion and irregular. So so he will if he goes back, he'll probably be sent to jail by some irregular form or shape, because. Uh, I mean, he is uh, uh, identified as an enemy of, of, of this government, as, as, as we independent media are also, but he's probably the most... Uh, no, it, it, it's a process. It's a judicial process where uh, uh, El Universo and, and their owners and Palacio had no guarantees. That, that's the problem. In, in everything since the beginning, it, it, it's been an irregular process. And now the new court, because there's a new court, they didn't want to take to to take this a uh, case, this hot potato. Mm -hmm. so they wanted the old court to solve it, but at last minute uh, they didn't do it. So the new court, that is supposed to be the clean court, pristine, the pristine <laughs> court, is going to be uh, uh, in in trouble. So uh, uh, there are no guarantees, and yes. and. That's uh, the most terrible thing, that to go to justice and had no guarantees to a fair trial. Now you, you, you do see, you referred to the Isaias case, uh, uh, there absolutely are no guarantees, and the Congress even promulgated a law that, that, that basically said you couldn't appeal, or it, it basically singled out, in the, in the public law, it named, uh, except in the case of Isaias, you can continue to persecute yeah. in certain ways. It's a, it's yes. pretty extraordinary. And, and one of the things that I would like to point out, because I would like to tie in what Rafael was saying with, with, with uh, the question about questions or, or the Commission of Inter American Human Rights in general, the, the first irregularity on this suit, on this process against El Universo, starts with the suit itself, meaning that it is based on laws that, even though existing, they exist in Ecuador, the laws are in frank contradiction with our Constitution. Correa approved, you know, he, he promoted a new constitution three years ago, and that constitution states that local law is going gonna, is gonna to be subordinate to international treaties, first and foremost. So by international treaties, you know, criminal libel law should be, uh, you, know, you know, over and done with. So all of those shouldn't be in our, in, in, in our, legal, in our legal system. You know, but they're there. Three years after a new constitution that forbids them, you know, they're there. And when they're asked, when the president is asked about them, and his and Alexis Mera, his his, his right hand man in, in the law, um, they are said, well, you know, they shouldn't be there, but they're there. So we're going to work with those laws because that's the law we have. So they're going forward with criminal libel laws that international treaties forbade them, and the constitution say they shouldn't be there. So it, it's just, and the genesis of all this, it's all irregular. I mean, these guys are really, you know, going against everything they've worked, they've been working for in the beginning. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. We have a questioner down front in the second row. Please state your name and your affiliation. Hello, my name is uh, Andy Judah. I am from Argentina. I, I work with one of the newspapers that in Argentina has a perfil, has less advertising from the government. <laughs> uh, the process that we are seeing in, in Argentina is different from Ecuador. We are seeing that the government is distributing advertising, and most of the advertising goes into the media that is more related to the government. And uh, we that maybe are more independent, we are getting less and media that are huge, uh, that used to have a lot of uh, of uh, relationship with previous governments are getting much, much, much less, talking about the group Clarín in Argentina. So my, my point, I, I want to, to, to ask you a question that is not related to the judicial process. I want to ask you a question related to the media of what's going on. We are seeing in, in, in Latin America with this kind of process that is only one voice growing. For example, in the, in the radios of Argentina, you are seeing that 70% of, of the radios have a, advertising from the government, and, much, and we are see, uh, observing that they are turning into only one voice mm -hmm. sometimes, and there is not confrontational voices. I want to ask you if you are not seeing also this process in Ecuador or in other countries, that sometimes it's going to be only one voice, and we are not going to have any debate, we are not going to have any discussion about how democracy works, and although your voices are being trying to be shut up with the judicial system, what the people is observing that they are only receiving one voice from one line if this continues the trend, and there's not going to be debate. You know that here in the U.S. we have debates, CNN, Fox, uh, we have debate all the time, and it, the debate creates democracy. So the perception of the people, finally, is that they are losing democracy, and there's no any more democracy if you only see one voice. 
what the people is feeling of all this? This, this is my, my, my question. One comment? <laughs> okay. Um, if you ask me if I am afraid of doing my job, I will have to answer yes. <laughs> but I'm here. <laughs> anyway, mm -hmm. uh, in Ecuador, if you uh, separate uh, um, the media that belongs to the government, you have, I don't think you have 5%, I think you have more. No? But uh, that media should be also classified in, in, in several groups. The group that is a, a friend of the government, so they support them, they have a, their propaganda, their, their publicity, and, and they, they get along very well. Then you have the press that is, a, 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 how do you say, a blackmail? Blackmail? <laughs> if you do that, I'll punish you, I'll, I'll uh, uh, withdraw your frequency, your radio frequency, your TV frequency. And there's the group that is uh, uh, also afraid because uh, they know, they have no problem, but they know that if they do something uh, wrong or something that, that could uh, uh, molest or, or uh, how do you say, upset, uh, or bother. upset to bother the president or the government, you'll have problems. So you have to be ver very careful. Uh, if I try to be absolutely honest with myself, I will have to say that I am in that group. I direct a, 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 a newsroom at a TV station in Ecuador, it's a national TV station, and I have to check everything because uh, uh, I don't know what's going to happen. And the reporters tell me, it's okay, don't worry, I know what, I know what I'm doing, I know what I'm writing. I say, okay, go ahead. And then you see something, you watch the, 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 the new show and you, you think, oh my God, what's going to happen? So that, it, it, I get nervous every day. So uh, that's, that's not a, a good atmosphere to work, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I, mean I, I, I cannot say that my freedom of expression is being violated. I, don't, I cannot say that. I cannot say that the government is uh, pressing me. I cannot say that. I cannot say uh, that I receive a call from the government or from somebody or, 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 or from the owner telling me not to do that. And I have never received uh, that. But I can feel it. <coughs> I, I know it. I know that if I do something uh, wrong, I'll be uh, uh, sanctioned. Yes. Nicolas, what, he, what the questioner was asking was, is there any sort, I think, is, is there any sort of popular reaction to this? Do they, un, do people in Ecuador, mm -hmm. uh, or, yeah, others can comment on this as well, are people in these countries recognizing the, the, the real peril of, of suffocating of free expression by attacks on the media? I, I think that the group of people that actually, in my country, that actually care about what's happening with the country. I mean, that read newspapers and that, that watch newscasts and, and that are actually in the debate about the issues that, that affect the country are a really small group of people. And I think that's part of the reason that, that explains Korea's level of popularity, above 50%. Because I think 50 per, that 50% 50 of people are mostly, are just sad. I mean, their view of democracy is pretty much roads and bonuses and, and subsidies, you know. That's what they think is a good democracy for. Um, they don't. They don't value debate. They don't value, you know, uh, diversity in, in opinions and ideas. Uh, so, um, I, I just think there's a small group of people that that see it. And of that small group of people that see it, all a smaller group of people, you know, are actually the ones that are care enough that actually want to debate about it. Because a large group of people in that group of people that see it are either making a lot of money with this government, I mean, in this, in this regime, via direct contracting with the government, or because of the, popul or the populist, you know, consumerist economy we have buoying because of all the money that's being thrown at it. So, you know, a lot of people are very happy with the government, I mean, with, with the regime because they're making a lot of money. So, um, now, you made another question also, which is about, um, uh, the media. I think there's there's one st there's two stages or, or two f forms of of media con indirect control. One is right now 
advertising. You know, uh, this government has spent more advertising than the last, you know, 100 governments. Um, uh, just last year, they spent 30 million dollars, and their budget for this year is 300, tenfold. You know, in an electoral year. So those 30 million dollars last year went to, you know, mostly radio stations and TV stations that are small enough so they can keep on the payroll and have them confirm in their line of thinking. You know, propagandist thinking. Um, so that's the first part. You know, there's the group of people. Now, the second part is going to come in the media law. The media law is going to comprise uh, uh, different aspects, but one of the principal aspects of the new media law that President of Congress Cordero guaranteed to be voted on and, and approved by March is a property uh, uh, limiting, a limit, which is, uh, which is the same, we assume is going to be the same, that's already in effect in the telecommunications law, which affects networks and radio stations. But they need the press, you know, which, because the press doesn't have any frequencies assigned to them, they cannot control them yet. So what this uh, states is that any owner of any media uh, that owns more than 6% of any media company, of any media outlet, cannot own you know, or participate as director <laughs> down to the four, any of himself or any of his relatives in the fourth degree of any other kind of business. Meaning, and that's going to target me. I mean, me as a media owner is not going to target my sister if she wants to open, you know, a beauty parlor. I mean, to say something, you know, um, because if she opens that, the council is going to come after me and say, you know, you're in a conflict of interest. How can you report independently of what happens in that media parlor because your sister owns it? So in that way, we're going to seize your shares of this national media outlet and we're going to sell them. We're going to actually, you know, sell them outside and give you the money. So uh, this is going to be approved in March. This was, by the way, approved in the referendum. You are the that, that was one of the questions. <laughs> Do you, the people, want you know, media owners to own any other businesses that are not uh, those of media? And the people said, no, we don't want to. Only so. one real question. The only thing interesting is that what you added is that there is people making money with all this. And in Latin America, especially in Argentina, we are seeing something called periodismo militante, militant journalists. Mm -hmm. They are journalists that they are... They are not objective, absolutely, <laughs> and they are called militant. Mm -hmm. And uh, it seems that they're making a lot of money. I don't know the situation in, in Ecuador. Yes. But, but, well, uh, in point of fact, I would think that a lot of these media owners, the only way they can keep the presses running is engaging in other, other commercial enterprises. It's certainly the case here in this country. Uh, Joel, you yes. want to? So, I think that the, the interesting point is they not only control, like you, like you mentioned, across the continent, they, don't, they don't, not only control the message, but they control the message about the message. That is to say, in the U.S., they use the or or internationally, they talk about democratization of the of the speech. Um, and so instead of using like they used to do back in you know back in Russia or back in or maybe in Cuba, one state voice. We're going to listen to Graham. Now. We're going to listen to. Instead, that there are hundreds and thousands of community radio stations, but these have all been selected a dedo by people who are pro-government. They've been given support uh, via some subsidies, via some equipment, and they're delivering the message. So it's, uh, and then they go abroad and say, well, see, look, it, we're taking the, the power away from the great, rich, you know, media tycoons, and we're giving it to the people. When in point of fact, what you're getting is one, is sort of, is sort of one message. And then they, and it, it sort of, it's, just, it's the exact same approach that they use with the internet. Instead of doing what, you know, what Syria does, which is try to shut down the internet, you just create so much chatter with your own message, with all of these thousands of internet sites and Twitter accounts that go ha you know, attacking people, that, that you create this, this ability to out-communicate one message, the opposition. So it, it's an interesting new dynamic. According to the bill, uh, the communication bill in Ecuador, 34% of the uh, radio stations will have to go to the com comunidad, radio, community radio, 33% uh, to the government and 33% to the private. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, they'll own 67%. Mm -hmm. That's right. Other questions here? I, I have a couple, so I can jump. Uh, Mr. Coleman, uh, I have to admit that I've, in my involvement in public policy and different positions I've had, uh, been interviewed by uh, reporters who got everything wrong. Uh, and, and it's tended to be happen more in Latin America, quite frankly. Uh, uh, I mean, people don't even check the spelling of names or, or, or et cetera. What do you folks do in terms of professionalization of, of the media? Do you do any training? Yes. To, yeah. 
we have we have uh, the International uh, Press Institute uh, that we run uh, out of Miami that trains uh, journalists. We work a lot with with universities. We just had a big session uh, in Puebla, Mexico, uh, where we worked. You have to. There are two or three things that we need to work on. Some of it is basic skills. Some of it, some of it is, is, is basic uh, accountability. And also, you know, among journalists in Latin America, there are different ideas about uh, what we call objective journalism. Some people do not believe that, that, that that's the way journalism uh, should be. And many newspapers in, in Latin America were begun by uh, private enterprises who then started a, a newspaper to get their line out. Mm -hmm. And so there, there is a history uh, there. And unfortunately, like when I was in Venezuela, uh, there are some good newspapers there. There are some not so good newspapers there. And, and the Venezuelan government would, would not speak uh, to the privately owned press. And, and so the, the discourse, the public discourse in Venezuela was often what I called uh, uh, a dialogue of monologues, that the, that the government had its side of the story and the private uh, media had its side of the story, and nobody knew what the story was in the middle. Uh, so s some, of that, some of that has to be worked through. Some of that also is, is uh, traditions uh, based on laws, that, that um, uh, this, this whole idea of, of uh, criminal uh, uh, defamation, uh, is, it doesn't exist, as, as, as you said, in, in a lot of other parts of the world. Uh, and, and we try to, all, to help journalists get a very good understanding of, um, uh, of the law and how the law works. The other thing that, that we and other organizations do is we try to teach Latin American journalists about uh, investigative journalism. How do you do it? In, in some instances, there are practices that are really not uh, kosher. For instance, uh, journalists in the United States, by and large, do not go undercover. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, certainly journalists at the Washington Post don't. Uh, journalists here do not secretly re uh, record telephone calls because all of those things really take away from your credibility. Uh, and you have to build uh, credibility among the people. My example uh, is, uh, is if, you, if you compare what happened with El Universo, uh, it would have been like someone bringing criminal charges uh, against a Washington Post columnist during Watergate. And, and in fact, what happened was that the press in general, the Washington Post in particular, uh, had enough support among the people so that when, when Attorney General John Mitchell made his famous statement about a, uh, a part of Mrs. Graham's anatomy being caught in a ringer, uh, that didn't happen. And he knew he couldn't do that. Uh, and we've not gotten there yet because in Latin America you don't have this long tradition of accountability reporting. You know, uh, and, and, and the book, when Ground Armando, Big Brother, uh, is simply accountability reporting. Mm -hmm. it, brings, it calls into question the actions of the president uh, mm -hmm. in the same way that Woodward Bernstein did with Watergate. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we, we don't have those traditions. Uh, we and many others are working uh, to try to improve the level of, of journalism in Latin America. But one thing is very, is very clear. It is not so bad as to justify many of the measures that are being uh, taken, including uh, trying, to, trying to turn uh, the populace against uh, news organizations as a whole. Because the fact of the matter is that news organizations, uh, like the newspapers, uh, like the TV uh, stations, they are corporate citizens. They are businesses. They have a right to exist. They hire people. They have a right to their own opinions, usually on the editorial page. And, and to take away their business uh, uh, is, is just wrong. Exactly. You know, right. and, 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 and that hurts uh, the people in the long run because uh, in Ecuador, the people are not going to be able to judge the candidates for office because the press is being uh, uh, intimidated and their hands are being tied. Right. In Ecuador, they don't even want you to mention the name of the candidates for office, or <laughs> yeah. potential presidential candidates. Please. 
Hi, uh, my name is Maricel Tres Palacios, and I wanted to bring back the conversation to social media, just because I think it's so prevalent now, nowadays, especially with the Middle East, Twitter, Facebook, and all of these things. I personally think that this battle uh, um, of governments taking over the press and all of this uh, can be sort of fought uh, effectively if we atomize it and take it to the individual. Uh, and I just want to take your, your opinion on how can this social media and all of these new mediums that we have right now can help uh, to or can promote um, and okay. contribute in this battle. And I also wanted to make the point that uh, it's true that you can take, I think, you can take a newspaper or a, a governmental newspaper and inform and give tons of information uh, one-sided. But I think that it gets to a point where individuals are thirsty for other types of opinion. I see it in Cuba. Cubans would die for to read, I don't know, a new Miami Herald or BBC. They so do. I think that <laughs> there, it, it gets to the point where it's so much a saturation that they just, I think, I can't stop believing in the source of information. From right. I, I mean, I, I agree 100%. Uh, you're the blogger, Joel. Why don't you just I think that, um, I mean, you're, you're absolutely right. The, as the spaces get less and less, especially in Latin America, as the spaces for, uh, for formal um, dissent, if you will, um, via the press become less and less, people are turning more to, uh, to social media. So you see, for example, Venezuela, I believe, is number four in Twitter usage on the planet. Um, and it's a country with about 30 million people. So they, they increasingly go towards, towards using Twitter to find out sort of what's going on. I'll give you a case in point, um, back to intimidation. Global Vision, which is the opposition TV station in Venezuela, um, the independent TV station, excuse me, um, uh, has been covering uh, last year a riot in a prison where the former interior minister, al Asami basically ordered an assault on the prison. There was, the people still don't know how many people were killed in that prison, but it was, it was dozens. Um, so Global Vision covered it because it was, a, it was a really bad prison riot and the prison situation in Venezuela is very really bad. So um, Global Vision was then uh, accused of fomenting violence by covering the violence, however that works, and was uh, fined $2 million and the fine never actually, you know, the, the due date arrived and the government didn't, they didn't pay, government didn't close, they sort of backed off. But, um, but it was interesting because you sort of, you look at, you, so, I, so you go to Twitter during that moment and you see all of the information from people in the, in the neighborhoods all around this, this, this jail cell, t this, this jail telling exactly what was happening and I heard this and I saw this and this happened and, and granted, you know, you can't, it's not, it's not professional reporting, you can't sort of, but it's interesting to get a feel for what's going on and I think that as, um, and especially more, more with, with television media than print media, because print media comes out sort of the day afterwards, but television media, it's telling what's happening with a particular riot, with a particular situation, with a particular, which is why, for example, in Venezuela, the, the, the Venezuelan government's been much harsher on the TV media than they have on, on individual, um, for, like, on the written press, because that's the bit, that's the, the message that's gonna be able to motivate people to understand what's going on in this specific moment. As that gets closed down, the uh, internet is gonna become much more important. Hmm. Uh, but you don't really reach a mass audience with Twitter. I mean, Venezuela is sort of different, uh, uh, but I mean, we're fooling ourselves if we think that 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 that, that reaches the sort of D and E category uh, in terms of. Uh, but, but it's but it's growing. It's, it's growing. Maybe I'll just hold this up like this when I need it. Uh, it's growing, and and uh, uh, and more importantly. It's young, and young people are the ones who are on social media, and you have to reach young people. And, and sooner or later, you know, it is going to be uh, uh, much, much larger. And, and it is no accident that in Venezuela, uh, Chavez has done, what, 350 radio stations? Because so many more people listen to uh, uh, radio uh, than read uh, any of the newspapers. Mm -hmm. And, 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 that, and, and that's, the, that's where you have to go. And so our next battle is going to be to make sure that uh, digital communication is not locked up the way they're trying to lock up uh, print communication. You know, the, uh, I was in, in Bogota in, in uh, November, and the Colombians are, think, are, are trying to find a way to make sure that uh, uh, digital information uh, it's free to everybody. I mean, it's, everyone's free to use it, not necessarily free of cost, but, it, but it, uh, the digital airwaves, so to speak, 
uh, are kept are, are kept free. And it is an irony of, of the Inter-American Press Association that so many of the cases that we um, uh, stand up on behalf of do not have to do with newspapers. They have to do with television stations. Mm -hmm. They have to do with uh, with radio. Uh, uh, and in Mexico, toward the end of the year, uh, two of the seven journalists who were killed uh, were online-only people. One of them was a blogger. And mm -hmm. and and so uh, I think we really have to get to uh, social media. Let me tell you just one interesting story about social media. Every every year when IAPA meets, we have country by country reports on freedom of expression. So when we met in Aruba, uh, there was uh, it was time for the Venezuela report, and and uh, the Venezuelan report is always one of the most controversial because it's it's usually given by a, a Venezuelan group that the Chavez administration absolutely hates, the Bloque de Prensa. Uh, and so they always try to, to, in some kind of way, disrupt the report. Uh, so they decided to send a bunch of community journalists uh, uh, to this meeting who really had no uh, uh, business doing a lot of things that they did, but we, we allowed it. But what was most important is people in IAPA said that we are going to tweet on this. We're going to use uh, social media. And we're going to we're going to put up the, the tweets right on the uh, on a big screen so everybody can see them. So here comes the report up, and uh, and immediately uh, the um, uh, the blogosphere and, and, and Twitter, uh, you can tell the Venezuelan government people who are tweeting because as soon as something is said, they try to knock it down. And then what happened? As soon as that was said, somebody else came back up and said, "No, that is not true." And so it was, it was an amazing uh, dialogue taking place. Meanwhile. <clears throat> Global Vision was broadcasting it live, you know, uh, and uh, it was a remarkable way of getting into the country. And uh, two things happened uh, at the end that were that were significant. Uh, one was that uh, the head of Global Vision, uh, Mr. Zulaga, when he went back to Venezuela, uh, was arrested, and and uh, and his company uh, was threatened. Uh, uh, because he said things there that they thought uh, were anti-Chavez. But at the very end, after all of these community journalists from Venezuela, uh, each one of them got to ask their question or got to remake their remark. They insulted our members sometimes. They said things that weren't true. Uh, they read co Their comments were written on cards, which we knew someone else had written. Uh, but at the very end, Ale Alejandro Aguirre, who at that point was the president of the, the head of the um, uh, organization <clears throat> uh, told those community journalists that he said, you know, every one of you had a chance to ask your questions or speak here. Every one of you got to say what you said. You insulted our members. You insulted our organization. You said things that were not true. But that is freedom of expression, and that is what does not happen in your country. And it was a very powerful moment. And it would not have been able, we would not have been able to be as successful as we were on that without using social networking. So I believe we really have to get uh, into that uh, as much as we can. That's a, a great way to end this presentation, except I, I, I won't. Uh, <laughs> because I'll note that this, the tweeting does not supplant real journalism. It drives traffic to the real journalism. I mean, I'm when I, I'm a consumer of the tweeting, and I'm I don't care about what somebody puts in 140 characters. But if there's a link to a story, in the Washington Post, of course, I'll, I'm, I'll, I'm, it drives the traffic to the to that to that good reporting. So I want to thank all of our panelists for coming. I encourage those from Ecuador that there is solidarity. Thank Milton Coleman, and his group and his leadership and his great presentation here today for ensuring that there's this attention to this issue and solidarity. Uh, thank Joel Hurst as well. Appreciate your coming. Thank you thank very you. much.